walking through a fern covered forest floor like we see around me today, it can feel like we've gone back in time to a place where dinosaurs roamed the earth. If you ever felt like an extra in Jurassic Park while taking a hike here at Suez like I have, you're actually not too far off. Hi, I'm Morgan Wren and I'm an environmental educator here at Suez and today we're going to be learning all about frolicking through the ferns. Ferns were actually the first leafy plant here on Earth. When life began a long, long time ago, way before animals and humans, everything lived in the ocean. The ground that people, plants, and animals live on now was just too hot, too rocky, and the air was not yet breathable. What makes the air that we breathe? The answer to that one has got to be plants. Before we could make our homes here in Wisconsin, there has to be oxygen in the air for us and other living things to be able to breathe in, to live. But how does plant make oxygen? And that is answered by the process of photosynthesis. Photosynthesis is a pretty big word, so we can break it down into two chunks. The first of that being the word photo. Photo is going to mean light in Greek, and then synthesis, which is going to mean to put together. So if we take light and putting together, we can kind of think in our brains that this process has something to do with combining light to produce something else, which we're gonna assume is oxygen. This process has everything to do with the color of my plant's leaves. You can see that these leaves are green because they're full of this little pigment called chlorophyll. And chlorophyll, its only job is to just suck up all of the sun's rays shining down onto the plant. And once the sunshine is combined with carbon dioxide, which the prehistoric air was full of and is filled with now, and water soaked up from the ground, it produces oxygen for us to breathe, which comes out of the plant's leaves, and sugar, which the plant uses to grow. In the ocean, there's algae, which is a super small plant that has no roots, stems, or leaves. So algae came up from the early oceans that looked like this, which is a lot different from the globe we see today because this was before our plates shifted to where they are now. They came up from these oceans and evolved or turned into, after a very long time, into the ferns that we see today. Ferns are special because they're the first plants to be able to bring water and nutrients up from the soil to create that sugar that we talked about before in the leaves. Fern leaves are called fronds, and the water is brought up from the soil in their stem that has lots of little holes like they're drinking from the ground with a straw. These stems and ferns are located under the ground and are called rhizomes, and they create long and complicated maps. Because they're protected in the soil all year round, this allows them to sprout up leaves up in the same spot year after year. And this is also what made them so durable to survive early life on Earth. Ferns differ from flowering plants in one really important way. Flowering plants reproduce or make more of themselves by making seeds. Flowers take a lot of energy to grow. They are colorful and smell good and they attract insects to come and pollinate them. The insect lands on the flower to drink its nectar and when they do, they brush up against the male flower parts which are covered in pollen. And then when it lands onto the next flower, some of that rubs off on the female part and that makes seeds. As Earth's earliest plants, ferns couldn't really use the energy to create flowers like a lot of our plants do today to be able to reproduce. So how can a plant reproduce without using seeds? Well, the answer is spores. So mushrooms, moss, and ferns all use spores. And spores are these little dots that you find on the underside of ferns' fronds. 
So these dots are actually called sporangia, which is another unfamiliar word, but if we just concentrate on the fact that it has the word spore already in it, we can just think sporangia, spore makes the spores. So these sporangia can be dotted in solid lines along the plant like I have here, or they can be randomly placed all over or just cover the entire underside of the leaf, but they're always going to be on the underside. So here I have my adult fern with sporangia. Now, once the sporangia are ready to go, they actually are going to burst and spray into the air and when they spray into the air, they'll fall near and far from the parent plant wherever they can find some bare soil. So here are my spores and they're flying through the air looking for somewhere to plant. Once these spores plant into the ground, they're gonna grow something called a gametophyte. And our gametophyte looks like a small green heart and that grows really tiny in the ground and it prepares it for growing into kind of like a teenager fern. So this is the adult, this is the baby. We'll call this a toddler. And once the gametophyte, just like our flowering plants had female and male parts, our gametophyte also has those two different types of parts, but we can't see them with our naked eyes. But luckily, gametophytes grow really well when it's in the rainy season, so spring, like we're in now. And when the water runs over them, the male parts are able to get to the female parts and grow something called a, sp a sporophyte. And that is just gonna be our little heart of gametophyte with a tiny plant, a tiny fern, growing out of the top of it. And that's the start of our ferns that we can recognize when we're on a hike. So next is gonna be the sporophyte. And then from the sporophyte, we get our fiddlehead. So this is what a growing fern is going to look like. This is what's easiest for us to see in their early stages of development. And they're called fiddleheads because they look a lot like the head or the top of a violin or a fiddle. So they're curled up into this tight ball, kind of like a roly-poly or an armadillo would to protect the young plant that's really fragile for being stepped on or the wind blowing. It's curled into a nice, tight little ball. We'll put that there. So finally, we have a fiddlehead, and then it just goes all over. It's gonna go back, grow some spores, and the cycle keeps going year after year. Right now when we go outside, we should start seeing some fiddleheads. It's been wet enough because it's spring, so those gametophytes should be producing the sporophytes that have that iconic fiddlehead shape. I have a few different types of ferns that we can try to find this season, and they're pretty easy to spot. The first is going to be our cinnamon fern, which has a tall, kind of dried up looking frond in the center that stays all year round, and that's its reproductive frond. So it's gonna be cinnamon colored, which gives it its name. And the fiddlehead that we'll see popping out of the ground right now is covered in hair. And it has cinnamon colored tufts on it. And the hair actually works like our winter coats do and it protects the small fiddlehead from the wind and the cold in the early spring. The next is bracken fern. Bracken fern is distinct because it grows out of one stem into the ground. So if you see something that only has one stem coming out, it's probably bracken fern. And the bracken fern fiddleheads kind of look like, they remind me of like a chicken claw, like talon. So they're longer and less compact. Next is the lady fern. And lady ferns have fiddleheads that look like this, so they have these black hairs that are also on the adult plant that look like a lady's hairy legs. So that's how you can remember lady fern. Ferns grow in damp environments. This could be anything from growing up in trees, on rotting logs, in the dirt, or through rocks. The ferns that we're gonna be finding in Wisconsin are gonna be on damp, bare soil because that's where the, it's easiest for their spores to take root. We're gonna be on a hunt today for some ferns to identify and it'd be a really great idea to take out a scientific journal to take some notes. Once we're out in the woods, like I am right now, we're gonna take some notes on our fern that we're spotting here today. So first of all, we have to think about what stage in its life cycle it is. Is it a gametophyte? Is it full grown? Is it a fiddlehead? 
write all that down in your journal because that's really great information to identify it later. Next, we wanna look at the shape of its leaf, how it's growing out of the ground, and the way the sporangia, if it has some, are placed along the leaf. Finally, does it have any unique features like the hairy legs on the lady fern or our cinnamon fern here, this long reproductive frond? This is all great information. Having these notes in your journal is important scientific data for a botanist because we want to identify this later and distinguish it from the other 10,000 different fern species there are on the planet. Ferns were important in early ecosystems because their fronds were wide and long enough to be able to capture sunlight to create the air that we breathe. Their rhizomes and roots are strong enough to be able to crack open rocks and decaying matter to make soil that all other life grows out of. And they were an important food source for other animals that evolved after them to eat. Ferns still have a really important job to do in our ecosystems here today. If you look underneath the frond of a fern, you might be surprised to find a whole host of animals there. It's nice and dark, cool, and damp for animals like frogs, salamanders, insects, and maybe even a mouse to make that their home because it keeps them nice and safe from both the elements and other animals. Humans have found ferns useful because when you harvest them as fiddleheads, they make a tasty meal that kind of tastes like asparagus. They also can be used in medicines and tinctures that help with blood disorders in the heart. Like on early earth, they are one of the first plants to grow in rocky, barren areas that could be caused by natural or human destruction. So they cover the ground, breaking up the soil and making it healthier for other plants to grow as long as inviting new species of animals into this once barren landscape. One special ability they have is to filter out toxins from the soil. And this can show us through the presence of ferns or the health of the ferns that are already there, how healthy that whole ecosystem is. Next time you're walking through a patch of ferns, think about its history. What would this have looked like back when ferns were the only plants on this earth? And what small worlds live under the ferns fronds today?